Good evening, folks. We're just waiting whilst you all come through the door. There's quite a number of you coming through. Nice to see you. Um, Amit, Anne, Bill, Eric, Heather. Oh, we only saw you two days ago. No, one day ago, Heather. Jennifer, um, John, just bear with me. I'm losing names because they're coming in that fast. <laughs> just humor me. Too many, too fast. A couple of Michaels, Justin and John. I, I honestly can't keep up. This is really, really good. That's a great Wendy, thing. Vincenzo, Teresa, uh, Sean, Ronald, Peter, Nanette. I can't keep up. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to give up on that one. Okay, but it's nice to see you all. Um, what we have done is we have opened the webinar chat. So if you go on the chat, you can say, hopefully, say hi to each other. Um, but if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. If you do post in the chat, can you remember to select to everyone? Otherwise, you will only be commenting through to the, uh, the panel, um, which won't really help. And I've just put something on the top of the chat so you can find it later, because you can see the recording afterwards as well. So Johnny says, if you have any questions that don't get answered tonight, you can contact him directly via his email, which is info at johnnyedward.com. And if you have any questions for Slab, you can contact him on hello at handpaintedbackdrops.co.uk. Let me just check. Attendees can now chat with everyone. So the chat's now live. So that should be working so you can say hi to people. I bet the Q&A is telling me the chat wasn't live. <laughs> Oh, looking good, Johnny. <laughs> that, that's from Michael, Michael Fidilla. Thank you, Michael. I, and someone Michael's a good friend of mine. Chat was disabled. It's now fine. We were just getting around to it. So that's the word. That's it. There we go. So everyone seems to be here. Let's go into the evening. So on with it. Um, I'm Stephen Nate, and this is Amy with me. Oh. We're from the Guild, both here to, to listen to this with with interest. If you don't know about the Guild of Photographers, you should. Um, <laughs> www.photoguild.co.uk. Slav is a member of the Guild and has been for quite a number of years, and he's also the creative and the brainchild, if you wish, behind hand-painting backdrops, and they lit literally live up to that name. They are hand-painted by him. And with him from the States is Johnny, and Johnny, I think, uses some of the backdrops, I'm presuming. He's a creative, he's an educator, and he's also a wonderful human being. And he'll tell you all, all about it as we go through. So we're going to bow out. We're going to be in the background monitoring everything. But just remember the big one, please. If you have a question, put it in Q&A, and then one of us can pick it up for you. So Slav, it's over to you. Hello guys, it's very, very good that you're joining us with Johnny today and I want to introduce him a little bit more. If you never heard about Johnny, but probably you did, um, you're probably living under the rock, isn't it? Uh, so um, today I have big pleasure to introduce and speak with Johnny. Uh, he's a very big talent and recognizable through the world uh, in the, with his portraits and photography. So um, his work has been published in Vogue and uh, his unique approach is just remarkable. I, I love every post what he's posting on, the, on the, um, his social media. Uh, he also using hand-painted backdrops and uh, uh, that's helping him to add some uh, depth and texture and layers and storytelling to his portrait because he's um, one of the person who are using those backdrops, not like uh, every um, photographer, just a straight backdrop. He's stacking them, he's putting them into the textures, he's uh, crunching them, he's just playing with them as much as he can. His studio covered with backdrops. So it's in this conversation today, we will find out his approach to his work. Uh, he will learn, we will learn a little bit of his uh, workshops. And one, one more thing, uh, I will ask Johnny to tell later what he's uh, creating now on, uh, in the web. And uh, also uh, 
to how he's planning and uh, it, just a little bit about the photo, show, photo shoots, how he's doing those photo shoots. So um, give him a warm welcome. And I, while I'm introducing him, I want to play his uh, um, photos, the short video of um, like a slideshow what we made for just to introduce if you um, been missing his um, channel and did not see his photography so i will share the screen nicely now and hopefully that will work yep and let's play it's been sharing Why have we lost the sound? It's back. So we're back and uh, Johnny, I love your work. I, I truly do. Um, I would like to ask you to kick off the, this conversation um, about the mindset, what it comes to the mindset when you're preparing to the uh, photography, to the portrait, to creating this portrait. Well, firstly, thank you for all the kind words and thank you everyone who dropped uh, notes in the chat. My ego is very validated right now. <laughs> it's it's kind of odd, like looking at a retrospective of your own work. Slav, thank you so much for putting that together. It was fantastic. But like for someone else to sort of curate a gallery and then to look at your own work, um, it's curious. But I think my mindset really revolves around, uh, I mean, people. And I think that's kind of an obvious statement because of course I'm involved in portraiture and fashion and editorial work. Um, but my, my main interest, my main passion is people. So my mindset always starts with how can I connect with the person in front of my lens? And so, of course, there's sets and there's lighting and there's technical considerations with cameras and lenses and focal lengths. But I never start on that side of the equation where my process always begins is who is going to step in front of my lens and how can I honor them? How can I lift them up? How can I empower them? How can I celebrate them? And the same thing is true, whether it's personal work or a, a commercial client or a personal commission, um, that is always the focal point of my work. And then everything sort of builds out from there. And I think it's an intangible element. Um, but for me, it differentiates what can just be a pretty picture from something that actually makes you feel. And that's what I want to do with my photography and my art always is I want to evoke emotion. And I don't know what those emotions may be. For some people, it may be good. For some people, it may be bad. But I really believe that that emanates from the human connection between me and the individual or individuals in front of my lens. And then things sort of just blossom organically from there if, if things are going as they should. Awesome. Uh, the, now it's trends all the time changing, isn't it? And uh, 
everything everything so fast and uh, also this uh, ai coming into the into the equation um how are you staying true to your own your vision uh, but still adopting the new ideas and techniques i think that's 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 a great question and it's it's a very fine line to walk um you know especially for those of us who are heavily involved on social media and most of us have met through social media through instagram through Facebook, some of some of you through TikTok and those types of things. So we're sort of forced into this psychological experiment, especially as artists, where we want to share work that's true to us, but we also want our work to be seen and appreciated by others. Mm. And so we have to be aware of these trends, these developments in our industry, but at the same time, we can't be so fixated on them that we lose our own voice. Uh, so it's a daily struggle to be completely honest. And I'm really big about being vulnerable with these types of things. Um, I, I, I step back and going back to that idea of feeling, and I know that's an intangible element, but I want to look at my work and feel something. And it could be sadness. It could be happiness. It could be joy. It could be sorrow, it could, whatever it might be. If, if I look at my work and I don't feel something integrally in my being, in my spirit, in my heart, then I, I did something wrong. So I always use that as a guidepost. And if I can create work that's on trend that that works with these things sort of collectively um that's great but that's not necessarily always the case so i don't know i, I guess i guess what i really want to say with this too just as an answer is if if there are those of you out there right now who are struggling obviously the algorithms are constantly changing and everything's evolving in the social stratosphere if you feel like your work isn't getting traction that does not that does not speak to the quality of your work and I think that's a very hard thing for us as creatives because we go, oh, well, I didn't get this many likes or I didn't get this many comments or this much, whatever it might be. And then we devalue ourselves and we devalue our art. And it's an easy trap to fall into. So I don't necessarily have a straightforward answer to how I cope with that. I think I just have to remind myself that ultimately, I believe photography is art, absolutely. And art is an expression of self. So if I'm not expressing myself, if I'm merely regurgitating or leaning into what's trending or something like that, then, then I'm not using my own voice. And the power that I have as an artist, the power that I have as a human being is to use my voice. And so if I get lost in that, it diminishes the impact that I can have with the people that I work with and also in the world, ideally, hopefully. Um, but it's it's challenging. It is. And especially, like you said, with the development of AI and you know, we're seeing these things and I, so many of my friends now are going, oh, you know, I, I got onto Mid Journey and I made this beautiful thing and it's in Milan and there's a model and she's wearing Alexander McQueen and it's flowing and there's people watching and here I am at my studio in Iowa, you know, working with someone. And it, so there, there's this divide. And so we're creating a greater dissonance from humanity. And I think humanity is probably the key for me. I want to stay grounded with people. I want to stay grounded with individuals in my life in front of me that I'm connecting with tangibly in time and space. And so I, I try and use that as my anchor, um, connection and, and people. And uh, I don't even wanna use the word reality because I think that's debatable, but my reality and what's in front of me tangibly. Mm. Yeah, I think um, I think the AI is uh, it's a little bit tricky because the people getting this feeling they can't create something. It's uh, and it's something beautiful, and that's it. But a photographer like you and a very talented photographer, you creating the real um, real um, feelings. The AI will never create something like this, isn't it? I agree wholeheartedly. And I think that's ultimately what's missing. I can look at AI and there are people who are immensely talented. So if you're out there and you're using it, it is its own entity. So I, I would never speak poorly of it, but it's a different entity. So when someone, if, if it's purely generative, I, I, I sort of take offense to the idea of calling imagery that's purely generative photography because photography has a relatively strict def definition. Um, and so if you use, let's say, AI to generate a background and then you bring your model or subject into that, that's cool. I think that's that's a form of photography. That's composite photography. But if all of it is generated, it's not. And that's not to diminish it as an art, but I think it's beholden to us to sort of protect the sanctity of this art form. Um, for me, photography has been a, literally a life-saving thing. Like it brought me back from the brink. It's allowed me to find place and purpose in the world. It's allowed me to, you know, help marginalize populations. And so I'm I'm very guarded about it. And I don't want to see it devolve into something where you can just call anything 
photography. And that's probably a subject for another time. And I don't want to get contentious. And I'm sure all of you out there have differing opinions. But the point being is I hope that if you're using AI, all of you who are here with us right now, that you're using it as a tool for inspiration, that you're looking at something that you generate and it's inspiring you to pick up your camera and to get behind your camera and do something that's big or do something that's new or do something that's unknown. So I hope it's a catalyst for you as a creative and not an endpoint. And that's sort of how I'm looking at it right now for, for photographers. Okay, um, my camera is playing up a little bit. Uh, I will change the battery after the next uh, after the next um, question while we will be talking. Uh, I don't know why it's it's on the charger, but it's still no enough power probably going on. Well, never mind. Uh, we will sort out. Um, while I will be changing the battery, Johnny, tell people uh, about your workshops. What do you do, and uh, what is the concept and techniques you you teaching uh, people on your workshops live? You're doing mostly live, but you also can tell this uh, um, small secret what you just told me before the Zoom meeting, and uh, you know we will go from there. So I. You know, for the workshops that I've done, there there are so many amazing photographers and amazing educators in the space right now, and and it was never my intention to try and compete with any of that. Um, but there there is a lot of very pragmatic, linear, sort of analytical education out there. So it is how to make your first 10k sale, how to create great personal branding photos, how to use a two light setup for dramatic or cinematic portraits, and that's wonderful. I, I think that those systems are, are really fantastic. But for me personally, what I saw as sort of an absence in the industry was this idea of artistry. And I think it's very easy for us to lose sight of that, especially those of you who do this professionally. You start counting on your photography to pay your bills and to support yourself, your family, your interests, all of these things. And so you start to move away from the passions or the interests that initially brought you to this art form. So in my workshops, what I like to do is say, hey, let's put that to the wayside. Let's not think about business. Let's not think about marketing. Let's not think about social media. Let's think about ourselves as artists first and foremost. And that's a big thing too. I, I, I no longer really refer to myself as a photographer. And the reason being is words have power. And I think when you call yourself a photographer, you limit yourself by what the, the sort of arbitrary definitions of photography. So I love photography, but I am an artist who uses photography as my primary medium. So when these workshops happen, I say, let's get together and let's be present and let's be vulnerable and let's be open and let's embrace fear and let's embrace failure because these are essential to our growth and to art itself. And let's create work that speaks to us and no one else. So I want someone to attend one of my workshops and go, you know what? I have a certain client base and a certain niche, but I'm not here to serve them. I'm here to serve me. And I want the people to attend to create something where they feel inspired to say, I want to print this. I want to print this for my studio or for my home or for somewhere else where they're creating work that inspires them, that moves them. And I think so much of this is it brings us out of ourselves as photographers and as artists. And it's about coming back to ourselves and saying, what serves me? And I believe that if, if we're feeding ourselves in that way, metaphorically speaking, then everything improves. Our business improves, our life improves, our mood improves, our relations with others improves if we're taking care of ourselves. And so it's an act of self-love. So it's really an invitation to say, you as an artist, come here and join me in this space and let's love ourselves and one another as creators away from capitalistic ideals and away from all of these other things purely for the sake of art. And I know that sounds really idealistic and romantic, and it is, because that's who I am and what I am at my core. But it really comes back to, I believe we have to make time to create art for ourselves and no one else. And so it's it's a space and a place and an environment um, to do just that. And, and that's that's profound. And I think once we get on track with ourselves, all of these other things sort of start to fall in place. And it's an, uh, an organic unfolding or blooming of sorts. And it's really beautiful and powerful. But, you know, if you have a plant and you're only focused on what's here by the sun and you don't nourish the roots, it doesn't get water, it doesn't get nutrients, then it dies. And so I think as we elevate, we, we move up and it's great. You're like, oh, well, now I have clients and this is happening and blah, blah, blah. And you grow and you get closer to the sun and you forget about your roots. And those are the most important things. So it's a return to that that seedling, mm. fledgling stage to say we have to continue to nourish this. And if we don't, 
it just becomes another thing. And, and I would, I would hate that because right now, more than any other time, the world needs artists. The world needs creators. We need a counterpoint to the ugliness and the hate and the vitriol and all of these things. And we as artists are in a beautiful position to be that counterpoint, but only if we are embodying ourselves. And that only happens if we're, we're creating art that's meaningful to us. And, and that's, that's kind of the, the thing. <laughs> And I can help you with that with beautiful backdrops. <laughs> it does help, absolutely. absolutely. No, well, when when you've been telling, um, when you've been saying about uh, creating art for yourself, those backdrops behind me, uh, I created them just because I wanted to to do something for myself. So um, usually, I'm painting the backdrops those what cells. So gray. Uh, yeah. olive red pink you name it those were cells and uh, as you know johnny you've been uh, you've been following me as well a very long time i don't create many backdrops with harsh textures yeah isn't it yeah so yeah my my backdrops mostly low texture but i wanted to create something interesting and something for myself and something for the soul and people love these backdrops even more and, and, and that, that's beautiful. And I think that's a really salient point. We get so stuck in this mindset of, of we project onto our, let's say, ideal clients or onto the world what we believe they want. But what the world really wants is us at our fullest. Mm. And so we, we, we tend to sort of like diminish ourselves or mute ourselves. Similarly, a lot of people who come to the workshop, you know, the, the, the rage is always, oh, soft light, ethereal light soft wrapping light, all of this stuff about softness. And then people come in and they play with hard light. They play with projectors and noon sun and all of these things. They go, oh my God, I love that. That's beautiful. There's so much structure and there's mood and there's drama. And then they realize that this is something that they've told themselves they shouldn't do, but that's actually very significant to them. And so I think for me, like all of you, we had a little chat before we got on here and I asked Slavomir, I was like, well, is this one of the new backdrops? Because I do follow him. And he said, yes, and I love it. It's beautiful. And obviously I'm a big fan of texture and those types of things but it's like it, it, it's it's an intangible element but because of that i can feel more of you in these pieces mm. and ultimately as artists people come to us for us our art is secondary they're there for us because we are personified in our art when we're doing our best so it doesn't mean everything you do i mean you can't just shoot you know blurry crazy esoteric looking images all the time and expect people to be banging down your door there's a market for that but you have to find that niche. But at the same time, you still have to make time to do this. And mm. even if it, those backdrops don't sell, the importance of that is that you created them and you feel great about them. And then that gives you energy to go and do those other things that may not be as fulfilling, but that are paying the bills. And so we oh, have right. to constantly, we, we move forward and we move back into ourselves, into the world and back into ourselves. Mm. And I think at, at our best, it's, it's a beautiful give and take between what we're giving to the world and those around us, and then what we're also giving to ourselves. Uh, when we start talking about the backdrop, so um, uh, what the factors you consider when you're uh, selecting the backdrops to complement your subject and uh, mood when you're preparing for the shoot? That's a really good question. Um, I'm, I'm pretty chaotic. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, I do do planning with my work, but there's also a lot of room for spontaneity. So like the first thing that I think about and I think this is something that hopefully is evident in my work is I'm always very driven by skin tone. So the skin tone of my individual, I want to make sure that I'm representing that accurately, that I'm representing that in a complimentary and beautiful way. So that's where I always start. Um, and so if someone has, let's say, fair skin and yellow undertones, I'm probably not going to put them on a yellow backdrop because that's going to make them look jaundiced or sick. So it becomes how can I, and, and it also has to do with what the client wants to say or what I want to say with my art. So if I want someone to be represented very regally, I might use a rich saturated color. If I want to show the melancholy in someone, I might use a cooler color or I might use a gray backdrop like the one behind me right now. And then in post-processing, push some blue or some cyan into that or desaturate it to give that feeling. So, I mean, I've been fortunate enough over the years to collect so many backdrops. And my studio is basically like a museum to canvas at this point. It is an absolute addiction. Um, but I have the ability to look at it and say, all right, how does this person look? Who are they? What do they want to be seen as? What do they want to explore within themselves? How can we lean into this essence of individuality? And then how can I begin to build sets and ideas and concepts around them? 
And so for me, the backdrops are foundational too, just because my biggest influence has also always been classicism and Renaissance and Baroque paintings and Rococo and all of these things. And so when I bring canvas, when I first started working with canvas, I was like, wow, there's this fundamentally almost timeless element that it adds to my imagery. And I love that because going back to trends, I don't want someone to have a photo taken by me. And two years later, they're like, wow, that was great in 2023, but in 2025, that looks horrible. Like, I don't want that to happen. I want these images to stand the test of time. And of course, how we perceive and interpret them changes, but I want them to be timeless insofar as I'm capable of doing that. And for me, things like this, what's behind me right now, they, they sort of evade encapsulation. And so they move through era and time and space and trend and in art form and all of those things. So it's it's creating something significant and tangible that isn't going to be quickly dated. Um, and that's a big part of my work, especially when I'm working for clients because I'm not driven by legacy, but at the same time, I want them to be able to show family members or children or friends five, 10, 15, 20 years from now and everyone to still go, wow, that's incredible. Not like, oh, I remember when we were all doing that. That's awful. <laughs> Uh, but you never, uh, before, I remember before you've been shooting them, um, creating the, uh, your art without the backdrops, when you yeah. start using backdrops, uh, how, how this happens, Wh who introduced you into the backdrops? It was, it was, ab it was absolutely the work of Annie Leibovitz. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Like, I think I, I've always been a fan of Annie, even before I started photography in a serious way. But, I, but when I, when I really started to get into portraiture, um, I really believe in that model of sort of, I don't want to say regurgitation, but replication. So like old master painters, they would replicate paintings and that's how they built their skill. Now that wasn't the end goal. Eventually you would want to become so skilled at replication that you were able to paint for yourself, your own vision, your own ideals. But I started to delve into photographers work that really drove me. So like more modern photographers like Annie Leibovitz, but then even going back to photographers like Irving Penn, who's one of my biggest influences. And, you know, so many years ago, Irving Penn was using the equivalent of canvas backdrops and muslins and things to create texture and interest and intrigue in his work. So I realized that one of the strong components of these images that I felt driven to was the environments. And the environments often were very minimalist, but there was always something like canvas behind, or even if it was a wall, it had some texture and some personality and it didn't feel sterile or clinical like things so often do. And shooting on psych walls are cool. I still do that for commercial work. I think there's sort of a beautiful element to just having someone on a white background or a black background without anything distracting. But at the same time, I, I started to realize that there's a dimensionality and an element that these backdrops add that I was very driven by and drawn to. And when I started to integrate them into my own work, I feel like it elevated my work to me, which going back to it was the most important thing. So then I had more confidence I had more certainty, I was more excited, I was more passionate. And then that sort of snowballed into what I was doing with my art and also what I was doing in my career as a professional artist. Okay, uh, I, for example, myself, I can't explain why those backdrops always look like a three dimensionals because I'm painting them. I can see them by my eyes. They are two dimensionals. It's nothing three dimensionals there. But when I start photographing on them, when I using them, I see those like a three dimensionals. Absolutely. And, yeah. And talking about that as well, about the light and stuff like this, how, how do you light? your subjects what what do you use usually uh, i know we already uh, dropped a little bit about the soft light and also the hard light and also the moon and sun and all all this nice nice stuff so can you tell a little bit more the approach on them on the lighting how do you how do you uh, when, when you see the person what do you look uh, first and what do you decide which which light you will be will be using in future well, and, and I, I, this, this is such a, a pivotal topic, I think, because ultimately as photographers, the way we communicate is through the interplay of light and shadow. I mean, that, that, that is literally, it's our pen, it's our prose, it's our canvas. This is how we talk. This is how we share. And in my workshops and in my work, like I gain traction through my lighting and through the way that I light. And, and there is no one approach. I think that's one of the things going back to even education that gets me sometimes is it's like, well, how should I how should I light this person? And it's like, well, you should light them in the way that works best for the person and the vision. 
And I know that's vague, but for, for me personally, there's far too much out there to say, oh, you use two lights and you put it, you know, one, one meter away or whatever it might be, inches, feet. I know we got this whole, we're archaic in the US. But anyway, you put it a certain distance away from your subject and a certain angle. And I don't believe in formulas. I, I don't believe in, in direct setups. Um, but a lot of times I, I, I like to mix hard light and soft light. I mix ambient light with strobes. I use constant lights extensively. And so there is, there is no one approach. Even for myself, I'm lighting myself in one way right now for this. But if we did this tomorrow, I might not light myself the same way. If I had a different backdrop or a different outfit on, the light may be softer, harder. There might be more shadow or less shadow. So for me, it's a very intuitive process. So I could look at someone and say, hey, if it's, let's say someone with a very chiseled jawline and structured face, I can go, well, we can bring light in from the backside and it's gonna, it's gonna enhance all of that. But is that what I want to do? Do I want to add more structure and rigidity or is this a person who has a structured face who wants to come across as softer? Is our narrative softer? And in that case, I'm gonna bring in soft light from the front to diminish those features. And so it's it's all an evaluative thing. If someone's coming to me as a client, my, my number one priority is how do they want to be seen? And also what are they potentially self-conscious about? If someone's like, well, I wanna make sure that I have a strong jawline because I'm, I'm, I'm you know, uh, anxious or self-conscious about my jawline, then I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to take that light up as high as it can go until I lose catch lights in the eyes, because that's going to enhance the structure in their face. So it's a give and take, and it's an interplay. And when it's my own work, it becomes, what do I want to say? Do I want to convey isolation? Do I want to convey empowerment? Do I want to, someone to look like a king? Do I want to show their sadness and their struggle? And so that influences whether I use one light, two lights, three lights, that influences whether I bring color in, you know, do I play with color and alter that and, and all of these other factors. So there is no one right way, but that's, I think for all of you out there, photographers, and I would imagine all of you are photographers of people. I mean, if you're shooting wildlife, you're probably not going to be here, although it's cool if you do that and you're here. Um, but it becomes how to see light. And once you learn to see light and you learn to see shadow, it doesn't matter what tools you have at your disposal or whether you're a natural light photographer or a strobist or anything else. How can you use that as your language to tell the story you want or need to tell? And fundamentally, I think that's what we're all striving for is to be able to seemingly effortlessly convey our vision and, and direct the eye and direct the mood and, and, and evoke certain emotions or thoughts and the people who are viewing our photography through that. But that only comes from experimentation and failure, especially. And if there's one thing I want to say more than anything else, you know, in our chat here, it's we have to embrace failure. We have like that is how we succeed. I've, I've probably I looked at my camera recently and I think I've taken like 800,000 photos in the past eight years, at least. It's like like seriously. The amount of time I've spent in the studio and with people and the amount of shoots I've shot that I felt horrible about and the amount of frames I create that I look at and I'm like, these are abysmal. That's an everyday part of my life, but that's why I've gotten to where I am and that's why I'm always getting better. Um, so especially with lighting, get out there and just experiment and explore and mess up a lot. And through that process, through that chaos, um, you start to really learn and gain an understanding. And you also start to fundamentally realize what speaks to you, which going back to the beginning of our, of our conversation is, is the linchpin of, of everything else. Hmm. Yeah, my camera starts playing up again. It, probably, Johnny, you are affecting your, uh, my camera with your fantastic vibes, you know, <laughs> she's like dying. <laughs> it's, a, it's good, it's, it's, it's got, you know, it's, it's just it's going in and out a little. <laughs> Yeah, um, I forgot my next question. Um, what, uh, how, yeah, the backdrops, uh, you're using those in all different way. You're stacking them, you're, yep. you're crunching them, uh, you're, you're putting them on the front of the um, um, model and covering the model with backdrop, making the dresses with backdrops. Tell us more about this. I would love to hear. So I, I think I think for me, like all things, um, it started off like the first couple of backdrops that I had. The first one that I that I bought was like off a of Facebook marketplace and it was a mass produced one and it, it wasn't very nice. But like for a long time, I was so obsessed with this idea of perfection in my lighting, in my work, in my posing. So I'm like, all right, there is a backdrop and it's perfectly centered and it's perfectly aligned and there's not one wrinkle in it and there's not one fold and it's this and it's that. 
And it's funny because this was years ago, but I started, I, I, gained, I started gaining a lot of traction on social platforms like Instagram and people were writing me very frequently complimenting my work, which was great. But I started to get this compliment that was like, oh, Johnny, your work is so clean. Your work is so clean. Like that was the descriptor. It wasn't, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it's emotional, but they described my work as clean. And at first I was like, sweet, this person from Brazil thinks my work is clean. That's amazing. Like how exciting. But then I really thought about that word and I'm like, does that, does that do anything for me? Like, do I want to be known as the, the photographer who produces clean imagery? And, and it really started to dawn on me that I became so obsessed with the technical nuance, with the minutia of all of that, that I lost sight of the person in front of my camera, that I lost sight of reality. Like reality is messy. Life is messy. There, there's chaos inherent in every moment. And I was, I was eliminating all of that and trying to create this very sterile bubble of perfection. And in the process, I was losing a lot of emotion. So I started to change my lighting. I started to change my techniques. I started to change my angles, my focal lengths. I, I, I just decided to mess it all up. And as I started doing that, I found more personal fulfillment and joy in what I was creating because it felt more authentic. And I know authentic, it's, it's another one of those words. It's so vague and it's so variable, but it started to feel more, more real, more significant. Um, and I mean, you can use words like cinematic. It felt like it was a moment in time rather than this, this sort of plastic thing that I produced and created. Um, and then with these backdrops, I started to once again, reference these photographers who are very influential to me and saw how they were using them. And, you know, there's backdrops falling off the wall and you could see stands in, and then we start talking about dirty frames and seeing elements of the studio. And then I went, actually, you know, these are these beautiful pieces of canvas. Like there's, there's a, there's a magic to when they're crumpled. There's a magic to when there's creases because that's like lines in our face, right? So it's very similarly, like, I, I feel like when I first started, even in retouching, as I was moving along, I'm like, I want everyone to look like this. And then everyone was a CGI character and, and no one was really real. And similarly with my sets, like, I want to show the fact that I've had some of these backdrops for four years and they've traveled across the United States and around the world with me and they've been dropped and they've had water spilled on them. And I've sat on them accidentally. And maybe one time one of them got lit on fire, like, who knows what happens, but like showing that character adds a certain sort of depth and complexity and, and um, dimensionality into the work. And so I really started to embrace that and realize, wow, I can create spaces and moods purely by deciding that instead of having the backdrop flat, I can move it 30 degrees off axis mm -hmm. or I can layer things forward or I can play with them together. Um, and even this, like something that I've done a lot um, with, you know, especially with Slav's work is this gray backdrop, these two other backdrops, this one here, and then this one here, are actually the gray too, but I reversed them. So one of the first backdrops that I ever commissioned from Slav, he sent to me and I got it. I'm like, wow, I love it. And when I was unrolling it, I saw the back of it and I went, wow, I love that too. And I started using the back side of it and it became, I, I, it's, it's on the other side of my studio right now. It's still hanging up the back side of it. And the front is amazing, but the back is just, it has this really organic texture and, it, and it's beautiful. So I'm like, there's no right way to do anything. And, and because there's no right way to do anything, there's no wrong way to do anything too. So I freed myself to just explore. And once I did that, I started using these things in atypical ways. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool and unique. And I like it. And then people are like, I've, I've never seen someone do something like that. And I'm like, well, that's cool too. So it, it, it's just, it's that evolution and progression of getting out of our own way, of, of trying to be less critical and more open and receptive and saying like, yeah. I've done some things with the backdrops. So I'm like, that looks terrible. Like I'm, I'm deleting this entire set. Like I will never show anyone because all of my credibility will be lost if I show this. And I know that's not the case, but the point is, is it, it, it was just a byproduct of experimentation and saying, what if, what if I try that, but then actually taking that into an actionable step and not saying what if, but, but trying it and mm. seeing what happened and very often loving those experiments and then becoming part of my process. Uh, yeah, you know, this, uh, somebody said uh, the people were uh, good at something, they uh, failed much more times when people were try, uh, just try it, isn't it? Well, you, yeah. will, you, you, can, you can tell this much better, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, but, but it's true. And that, that's the yeah. thing, too, is I think, you know, societally in the Western world, we have such a negative connotation with this idea of failure. You know, if, if you fail, it means you, you aren't good enough, you aren't big enough. If you fail, it means you disappoint people. It means you're humiliated. Like there's all of these associations with that word. And the reality is like, 
as silly as it sounds, as cliche and trite as it might be, like you have a small child who's learning how to walk. They stand up and they fall 50 times. And then on the 51st time, they walk 10 steps. And it's the, the analogy applies to literally everything. Like if you fall down seven times, you get up eight. And on that eighth time, you walk. And it's the same thing with all of this. So we we have to embrace that. If if you are avoiding failure, you are shortchanging yourself in the world so much. Because not only are you not growing and are you not stepping into your voice as an artist, but you're not able to share that voice with the world. And so all of us suffer. And so, it, like I said, it, it's just, it, it's literally fundamental to everything is failure. Now I will say, when I only had one backdrop, you wouldn't have seen me crumpling it because that thing was my baby. So I'm like, if anyone touches my backdrop, <clears throat> I will lose my mind. Get away from it. Don't touch it. Don't roll it. Don't fold it. Um, but, but as we move along, we become more comfortable with that. And, and ultimately all things are replaceable. Um, and time is finite. So we have to make the most of it. And, and that's just, it's messing up a lot. And that's how we get to where we want to be. And we have a couple of questions, but I think we will answer those later on. So um, I would like to ask you uh, one more question. What may be limitations of the hand painted backdrops? Do you do you know any where well, photographers might struggle to use them? So yeah, I, I think I think one of the things that happens very frequently or that I've seen is um it comes down to lighting. I think I don't I don't necessarily think that's a limitation, but I think it's a consideration. So these backdrops that are behind me right now, if I were to turn the camera around, I actually have, well, I have four lights. So I have a background light on this. I have a key light on my face. And then I have a big fill light that's coming in on both of those things. But I also have all of the ambient light in my studio. So all the natural light, because it's only, it's it's like 1 p.m. here roughly, or between noon and 1 p.m. I'm not looking at the clock. So it's earlier, so it's flooding in. So there's actually four lights with the interplay here, but someone gets a backdrop and they're like, oh, there's too much texture or there's not enough texture or the color is less saturated or it's more saturated. So I think fundamentally a lot of photographers and this applies to every industry, every art form because they don't understand how light directly impacts a subject, impacts a background, impacts texture. They don't know how to modify one backdrop for multiple looks. So, you know, for me, sometimes I hesitate to share things from my studio because I don't want someone to think that to create work like mine, they have to have a 3,000 foot square foot studio and 70 backdrops. I look back on my work when I was literally working out of the equivalent of a closet. I had 100 square feet of space and one backdrop and one speed light light and one modifier, and I still love that work. It was beautiful. And so I wasn't limited. limited. In fact, it freed me because I didn't have choices. Choices are hard sometimes. I have a client, if you commission me, Slav, you come here and, and you're like, well, what are we gonna do? And I look around and I'm like, I, there's, I have 50 lights and 50 backdrops, I have no idea. <laughs> and so it sounds, it's a first world thing to say, but it can be limiting because of all of those choices. So I think it's, it's not necessarily a limitation, but I would encourage all of you out there, if you have canvas backdrops or if, if you acquire one, learn how to change it. Light it from the side, light it from the front, light it with hard light, light it with soft light, backlight it, bring a light over the top of it, play with color temperature in your camera, play with the color of the light, play with color temperature in Capture One or Lightroom or Photoshop Raw, tone your image, see what happens to a gray when you add in cyan or when you remove green or whatever it might be, like make the most of that to understand how versatile one thing can be. Um, and I think that's very freeing uh, because there's so much we can do with a single thing, with the sun or with one light or with one backdrop. And all of us, because we do live in this society, have this, this idea of acquisition. Like to create better art, I need a better camera. I need a medium format camera. I need a full frame camera. I need a lens that's one, two. I need 22 backdrops. I need three lights. I need a strobe that's 1200 watts. We tell ourselves we need these things when it's not the case. You know, some of my favorite artists create work in parts of the world that are third world countries where they have a bulb and a wall that's been worn by time that they couldn't fix and they make beautiful art. So I think it's a limitation within ourselves, not so much with backdrops. So it's opening ourselves up to really all of these possibilities that exist around us all of the time. And once we can do that, there's never, well, I don't have what I need. Instead, the mindset shifts to how do I work with what I have? Mm -hmm. And that's when you become liberated as a creator and as an artist. 
Uh, we're running out of time, uh, but I want to ask one quick question from you. Uh, when you're um, commissioning the backdrops, how you communicate with the artists and uh, what do you ask them? What, how you, um, what the directions you give them and like how, how do you uh, make sure what you will get and receive that's what you want? That's, that, that's, that's a tricky question. It's a really good question, but it's really tricky. So um, if, if those of you out there, if you have Canvas and you're looking to get more, or if you don't have Canvas and you're looking to get something initially, I would highly recommend buying something that's in stock at first. I think like a custom commission is much more complicated than buying something that an artist already has available because you can go on and see texture and see light and know, and of course it's not gonna look the same in your studio. And there's all there's calibration and there's color and are you on your phone or are you, on, you know, there's all these things, but fundamentally you're looking at the same thing. Um, I always have visual reference. So I, I, this, the same thing applies to when I'm working with clients, you know, I have clients come to me and they're like, I want something really moody, Johnny, you're moody. I want moody work. And I'm like, all right, show me an inspiration photo. I'm like, collect a few things on Pinterest or off of Instagram or, you know, bring in photo books. I don't care. And then they show me these photos and I'm like, that is the least moody thing I've ever seen in my life. Like that is the opposite of moody. There's no mood, but because words are variable, using them mm. to try and describe something, it, it doesn't work well. And of course, then we could even get into it. Like, obviously if we speak different languages or we're working with non-native tongue, then there's even greater possibility for error in translation. So I'm very big when, I, when I'm working with someone like you, and, and obviously you know this, where I'm like, hey, I love this. Here's an example of your work that I really love. Here's texture that I really love. Here's tones that I really love. So I think that that visual side, it bypasses language into something that's that's mm. sort of universal. Um, and I would encourage all of you to do that for everything. Even when I'm working with models, I'm like, well, you know, I, I want you to pose in, in kind of like a high fashion way. And then my model goes, and I'm like, ah, like, is that high fashion? Is this, is this high fashion? And I'm like, not, no. So then I'm like, here, these are a couple of the poses that I really love. Let's start here. We're not gonna replicate these, but like, these are starting points. Let's start here and then we'll break up from that. So I'm huge on visual reference. And I think especially with backdrops, you know, mild texture to you isn't mild texture to me. Olive to mm. you isn't olive to me. And even with olive is a funny thing too, because I mean, language is weird, but it's like we have olive in our mind as a color, but we also have olives as like a food that most of us know and love. And then you look at like a Kalamata olive versus like a Castellanata and you have green and then you have black. And then you have brown and then you have semi-brown and you have bright green and you have light green and highly saturated and desaturated and shriveled and all of these things. So it's like, if mm -hmm. I show you something and go like, oh, this is the texture that I really like, but like, I like this color over here. Can we combine those? Can we make it like more earthy, but this texture and, and, and it, it's, it's better for all of us. And I think that that also respects the artist because the last thing that I want to do is give you a vague description and have you deliver something that you believe was right. And then me look at it and go, well, that's wrong because it's not wrong. We just miscommunicated. So anything that I can do to eliminate that, that miscommunication, I'm always on top of that. And it usually comes down to visual reference. Yeah. When you, when you order backdrops from me, uh, those, uh, airfy ones, mm -hmm. I remember what you exactly told me. Slav, I want something earthy. I believe you, you paint it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, 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 also, and sizes. And, and I, think, I think that's the thing too. Obviously it changes once you develop a relationship with someone. So ideally, I think that's the beautiful thing. Like when you're an artist and you're working with another artist, if, if that relationship evolves over time, then you can say, hey, I want something that's like warm with really low texture and you don't have to think about it because you're on the same page. But when you're working with someone the first time, it's even more important to get on that page using those references. It's 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 a really big deal. And that just it make, makes it better for everyone. And then everyone can feel great about what's being produced in the exchange, whatever that might be. Um, so yeah, use definitely reference stuff with with all things in your life because language is silly and you know, pickle to one person isn't pickle to another. So we have to be careful with with all of that. I always I always asking for references. Let's yeah. let's wrap up and uh, see what we have uh, question wise. Already? And, uh, yeah, so uh, I don't know if I will read the names properly. Me make I can't. <laughs> 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 uh, sorry, the person asking. <laughs> 
as you're painting your own backgrounds, uh, what is the first layer of treatment uh, to the fabric? Uh, are you using acrylic um, primer? Um, I think few questions for you. If you steam them uh, for use, and if you have straightened them and get rid of wrinkles, I probably you cover it this. No, <laughs> you don't do this, isn't it? Maybe some uh, accidental ones. Let's see. So someone said I, I want. Someone said I want to see the accident. Oh yeah, I, I will. I will absolutely after the fact. I will find the one that got set on fire. It's a long story, but um, I. I I, I found some inspiration on Pinterest and it had to do with the burning book and the burning book got too close to the backdrop and the backdrop started burning too. I kept it. Now it has its own character, but that just happens. Um, so someone asked what types of lights I'm using. Um, I, I use a lot, uh, but predominantly in my studio, I, I use a lot of constant light and the constant lights I use are by Nanlite. Um, so that's just my preference. I've been working with Nanlite as a company Full disclosure, I have a relationship with Nanlite, but I don't get paid by Nanlite. So I'm not on their payroll um, directly. I, I, I don't have an exclusive relationship with them. Um, and, and I really love the team over there that I work with. But the reason being is they're really amazing lights. They're super versatile. And relative to the price point, they're absolutely the best. They, they, they are phenomenal. And I swear by them. And that's pretty much what my whole studio is equipped with. So if you come to a workshop with me, for instance, we're going to use a lot of neon light. It kind of looks, it's actually kind of like a showroom for neon light. It's crazy in my studio. I have so many, so many damn lights. Um, let's see what I see. Another question about the backdrops. I can see the fabrics. What I use is Canvas 9.2, 9.5 OZ. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. So I saw... There's, there's another one that just came in too that's actually talking about it. And Slav, you're probably better off to talk about this than, than me, but someone um, actually ordered a backdrop or got a backdrop that had too much texture and then they were talking about how to modify it. This is another thing that I didn't talk about earlier when it comes to these backdrops that I think is an important point. Um, not only does lighting obviously affect texture. So, you know, we all know this, this idea of hard light coming in, like it exaggerates texture, it exaggerates pores. It does the same thing in backdrops. <laughs> So if you bring a hard light in from the side, let's say this microphone is the subject and we have a hard, small light that's coming in this way, we're gonna see all of the texture in this microphone. As we bring that light around to the front or if the front is here, we're actually gonna be flattening out that texture. Um, obviously the bigger the light, the softer the light, we're also gonna minimize texture relative to direction and those types of things. But because we're using a camera when we're shooting aperture, plays a giant role in this. So if I have a heavily textured backdrop and I'm like, crap, I'm on location, I'm doing a commercial project. They're telling me there's too much texture. What can I do? I'm gonna open up my aperture as wide as I can while still getting whatever I need to in focus. So if I can open that to 1.8 instead of shooting at F8 or four or whatever it might be, we're effectively going to blur out the texture in the background, just like you would do with environmental portraits outside. Similarly, if I want to exaggerate the texture, especially the micro texture and these low texture backdrops, I'm probably going to bring in some fairly directional light and I'm going to shoot between 5.6 and F8 because that's going to really enhance all of those textures. So this goes back to the idea of knowing your craft and knowing your gear. We can decide relative to our lighting, our position, our angle, our lens, focal length and aperture, whether we want to enhance or diminish elements like that. Um, and so it's just something to keep in consideration with all of this. And even right now for this zoom that I'm doing, I have a 35 millimeter one, two on my Sony that I'm using as my webcam. This scene would look incredibly different if I wasn't at 1.2. If I changed my lighting and shot the scene at F4, there would be less dimensionality. I wouldn't be popping as much. You'd see more of the actual texture instead of the blurred texture in the back here. So just by altering those parameters, this entire set and scene and me as well integrated into it would look and read completely differently. So that goes back to what am I trying to say? Like, obviously I wanna highlight these beautiful backdrops that Slav has created for me, but ultimately I want to be at the forefront of this. So all of the decisions that I've made for lighting, for aperture on the technical side of things are to keep me at the forefront and for these to be a beautiful background to me, but still them not to take focus so that I'm maintaining that in this frame for this webinar. Hmm. 
I often asking people when we're ordering and we're describing the texture we want, I always asking them, what aperture do you mm -hmm. shoot? Because exactly. well, it, it's irrelevant, isn't it? Texture is really irrelevant. Depends on the aperture you shoot. And if someone goes, I want, I want heavy texture and I shoot at one four always, like mm. that's going to have to be some heavy, heavy texture. texture. Isn't it? And similarly, if someone's like, I want low texture, but I shoot at F8, yeah. that's going to have to be almost flat. So yeah, yes. that, that, that's brilliant. And that goes back to communication. And that's obviously you being a consultant for these backdrops. But for me, everyone, this comes back to this idea that there's, there's no right way to do anything. There's no one way to do anything. And we're managing so many variables as photographers, especially those of us who photograph people. We have a person in front of us we want to stay connected to and we want to see them and celebrate them and lift them up. We have the environment, we have the lighting, we have our camera, we have the lens, we have all of these things. And then we still have to be present in the moment to make sure we're creating space for the person or people in front of us. So it's sort of a juggling act. And the only way you get better at that is over time, but it's the right tool for the right job. What do you have available to you? What are you trying to do? How can you use what's available to you to do what it is you want to do? That's really the formula. Um, and it's it's much harder than that in practice, but that's what it always comes down to. I just like to interrupt for a second, if you don't mind. Yeah. There's a couple of other questions in the, the Q and A. Please. So I thought I'd pick up on them. Um, first one really is for you, Slav. In, in terms of storage, what's the best way of storing when you have several backdrops? Do you fold? Do you roll? What's the best way of doing it? I rolling them, for example, all my stock, which I have painted, it's rolled them and they standing in the corner. So they, they, they cannot be light on the floor because we will develop this, you know, flat bottom and they will have wrinkles, which uh, they no nice wrinkles, not like Johnny do, you know, they, they just don't look good. So that, that way, uh, what, what else? A couple, a couple from Emma, this one's for Johnny. <laughs> And Emma's pretty good with styling herself. Uh, she's one of our members, so we know her quite well. Uh, Johnny, your style is incredible. Do you work with a stylist? Sorry, say, say that one more time. You, you cut out or my audio cut out. Your styling is incredible. Do you work with a stylist? So, so I, I, am, I am the stylist. <laughs> I work with myself. So I'll pro even before I picked up a camera, I've always been fascinated I, I loathe to use the word fashion. And I think that's a funny thing for me going back to words. Like over the course of time, I sort of got pigeonholed into being a fashion photographer. There's a lot I really dislike um, about the fashion industry. And I would even say strongly dislike to the extent of hate. So I, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with this idea of style because I think like the clothes that we wear and the accessories that we wear, we get to dictate how the world relates to us in any given moment. So I've always been fascinated almost from the social experiment aspect that I could walk out as the same person two days in a row to the same place and by styling myself differently, be received differently. Um, and I've always had a good eye for color. So generally I style for myself. Now, if a client comes to me and they have something that's outside of the realm of my styling, or maybe it's not my cup of tea, so to speak, uh, at that point, I'll bring stylists on. And I do work with stylists and wardrobe stylists are amazing. I actually do consultative wardrobe styling too. Um, but I think that's another thing too is, that that's sort of like learning to decide what you want with light. I would encourage all of you to play with styling, like play with dresses, turn them upside down, turn them inside out, make dresses out of fabric, buy stuff at the thrift store, a vintage store. Like you have to experiment and explore. And I've seen so many friends and colleagues who sort of took the chains off and let themselves go. And now they have this beautiful styling sense that was always there innately, but they never really allowed themselves to delve into. Um, but yeah, that was a really long-winded answer to a very short question. Um, I predominantly do my styling for, for all of my work. Okay, and a similar question, I suppose, of the same person, but is it important for photographers to experiment in front of the camera as well yes. as behind? Yes, absolutely. Um, so during the pandemic, I created a series, and at some point it'll probably become a, a book or a gallery showing of some sort, but I, I, I was so prolific before the pandemic started um, in terms of how much I was shooting. And I was shooting three, four, five, six days a week. And that was for clients. That was for me. That was with teams. It was with hairstylists, makeup artists. It was with friends. It was with models. And so I, I, my whole sort of life and world was defined by being a photographer. And then obviously that got taken away as it did for all of us. Um, and so I started getting in front of the camera more and I always did self portraits, but, but it was a really sort of powerful and profound experience for me getting in front of the camera. 
Um, and, and it really allowed me over the course of time, as I worked through the discomfort and the anxiety and the fear, to be more connected to myself as a person and more connected to myself as an artist. And I think that's really important, especially for those of us who are charging people to step in front of our camera. Like, I, I even the models that I work with often will say, I'm not photogenic. I don't necessarily love this, but I love the end product. I think it's beholden to us as photographers to deal with the discomfort and step in front of the camera. I think it's really important to flip that tide and understand what it feels like to be vulnerable, to be exposed. Um, to have our insecurities shown, to have to deal with our own anxieties, our concepts of self, our self-limitations, our self-loathing, our, our body dysmorphia, whatever it might be, because that's what our clients do. That's what the people do who step in front of our camera. So I think one of the most fundamentally significant things we can do as photographers is to be photographed. And I think that starts with photographing ourselves because that's a safe space. If Slav was taking photos of me, like I'm looking at him and I'm like, oh, what does he think? Oh gosh, that was a bad photo. Oh, I have a zit on my face. Oh, I ate I ate too much food and drank too much beer last night. I'm bloated. Oh, I'm not wearing my nice clothes. And so I'm I'm in his head. But if I'm photographing myself, I can look at them and go, I hate these. I delete them and no one else has to see them. Um, I also think it's really wonderful for, for photographers to be photographed by other photographers. And that's another thing. But I would encourage all of you out there, if you haven't experimented with self-portraiture, deal with the fear, deal with the anxiety. And over the next week or two, force yourself to get in front of the camera. And if you have such a disconnect with yourself right now that you don't even wanna look at them, that's fine. Take the photographs and format your SD card or your CF card or whatever it is right away. Don't even look at them, but challenge yourself to step in front of the camera and have that shutter click. And I, I, it's gonna do really, really incredible things. And it might be hard and painful at first, but it's gonna lead to some really beautiful breakthroughs for you as, as a person and also as, as a creative. Brilliant. Um, and we have another one as well. Um, it says for soft light setups, is it to use some big scrims and diffusers or do you bounce it more often? I'm just give me one second. My, I didn't realize my phone's still connected to the speaker. So I heard for soft light setups, I heard, sorry, would you repeat that one more time? Like yes, for, for soft light setups? For soft light setups, is it to use some big scrims and diffusers or do you bounce it more often? Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I want to say I'm really efficient, but the reality is, is that I am, I am quite, quite lazy. So uh, oftentimes I will just use the biggest modifier that I have on hand. And if I need to, I'll bounce it. I have a 10 by 10 scrim in my studio um, and it's against a wall right now. But the reality is putting that thing up, especially because so many of my shoots, I run solo, or I might only have one assistant getting that thing onto suit to C stands with a bracket and all of that. It's, it's pretty involved. So I'd rather just use one or two seven foot umbrellas and have that come in as my soft light source. The other thing that we always have to consider when we're thinking about soft light is proximity to subject. So if I have a seven foot umbrella, but I have it set seven feet away from my subject, that's not gonna be very soft light or not the softest light it can be. So I'm gonna take whatever the biggest modifier I have on hand in, in, in that moment, and I'm gonna bring it as close to my subject as I can relative to the invariables like the environment. And that's where I'm going to start with that. Scrims are great for commercial work. I use them extensively, but in my own personal work or for client commissions, I'd much rather just work with an umbrella that I can pop on, put on one of my lights, take it off if I need to, and then integrate that with other light sources than going through scrims. Um, I have everything in my studio painted white, the walls, the ceiling, and all of that. So I will bounce light as well, um, but I'm a minimalist at heart. So I won't use three lights if I could get away with it with one. So the starting point always is how can I do this with what's already set up? And if the only way I can get my aesthetic is by using something like a big scrim, I'll do that. But that's that's a rarity for me. Well, there's one final question for you, Johnny. How are we going to get you here in the UK? Yes, yes, absolutely. So yeah. um, <laughs> I've been I've been wanting to take this this whatever this is, this respective show on the road for some time. Um, and, and international travel, especially to Europe, um, is high on my list. So, so yes, I will keep all of you in the loop with that. And I would love to be able to come over there and even collaborate with the Guild and with Slav and do something significant um, in that space and in that, that part of the world. So, yes, count on that. I can't say exactly when it will happen now, but I can say that it'll be sooner than later. And that is absolutely at the top of my priority list. And, and it's going to be so wonderful to be able to spend time in that part of the world with all of you 
you know, connecting and making some really incredible art. Well, that would be amazing, but I will tell you it's raining here. <laughs> <laughs> um, just just one, one final thing, folks, just to wrap this up. Um, I've put a, a post just onto the webinar chat, which is giving you a, a £10 off the Guild membership, just as a thank you for joining us on here, uh, folks, if anybody wants to use it. I know we've got a lot of Guild members here, but if you want to, it's there. What I'd just like to finish with is, is Slav and Johnny giving their contact details and websites so you can go and look into these two wonderful people and, and the, the things that they do in much more detail. So Slav, we'll start with you. I know it's hand-painted backdrops, but perhaps you'd like to direct people to, to what you've got on there, because I know your stuff is fabulous. I see it at the shows we do. And if people on here haven't seen it, they need to. Yeah, just guys, uh, you can you can go my, on my Instagram, handpaintedbackdrops.uk, uh, uh, website handpaintedbackdrops.co.uk, very easy to remember as it says on the tin. And uh, I've been I've been thinking uh, I might beat um, uh, Guild this time, and I will give you twenty pound off if you order in next week with a code Johnny twenty from my website and also uh, check especially the, those people who are from USA or Europe uh, check uh, VAP section it's amazing for overseas shipping uh, is uh, VAP cost only 150 pound and you have free shipping for two bug drops or more and cheap shipping for one bug drop so uh, they, and that's for the year so if you're buying one uh, two two backdrops today, and you're paying 150 pounds shipping anyway. Oh my camera, my god! <laughs> and you're paying and you're paying 150 shipping anyway. So it's better to buy the VAP and have for a year two or more backdrops uh, shipping free, isn't it? So that's why I created to help our creators, uh, you know, our photographers to own some more backdrops. Johnny 20, remember that I will set up this. <laughs> I've just put that on the chat slab so people don't miss it. Johnny 20. Um, so, Johnny, <coughs> you, where do people find out more about you and what you have to offer? Um, yeah, so you can you can go to my website. If you want to see, so I mean, obviously we all deal with social media, um, but the reality is on something like Instagram, right? Like I've connected with most of you through there, but we evaluate images in these little 1080 by 1080 squares. So it's hard to even really appreciate imagery on that platform just because of how it limits it. So if you want to see a better example of my work, you can go to my website, which is Johnny, J-O-N-N-Y, no H, Edward, E-D-W-A-R-D dot com. Um, and look at my galleries. And, you know, if you click into any one of those images, that's the other thing I didn't talk about today, but I tend to shoot in series. So very rarely will you see me share one image. Um, it, it's usually uh, six, eight, 10, 12, 20, 25 images of a single person, often with different looks, lighting styles. And I think that's really important because one of my favorite quotes is within each person exists a great multiplicity. And so I think all of us have these varied elements of who we are, of what we are, and maybe some of those have been expressed and exposed and some of them haven't. Uh, but the point being is if you really want to delve into my work, you have to look at these series as a whole because it sort of represents um, how I try as a photographer and artist to honor the people in front of me and the fact that we are all tiered and layered and complex and we're not just one thing. And I think the more we embrace that, the better off we are. Um, in a more pragmatic sense, you can find me on Instagram, and that's Johnny, at Johnny, J-O-N-N-Y, no H, creative. Um, and the super, super quick story about that. People always ask me, they're like, Johnny, creative. Well, the reality is someone else on Instagram actually has my name, Johnny Edward. Like, they've had it for eight or ten years. And every year I send them a note, and it's an inactive account. They have no followers. They have no activity. But I offer to pay them. I'm like, give me my name. I will Venmo you money and they never do. But now every time I travel or go to conferences, people are like, Johnny creative. And I'm like, yeah. And so at this point, I think I might just legally change my last name to creative because there's no escaping <laughs> it. So what started in the, the account actually started. And as I started to delve back into photography, I started sharing that work and street portraiture and, in landscapes and then it just built into this. So uh, you can find me on there. 
And I know we mentioned it, this at the beginning of the chat, that these things can be hard because they're so compressed. But if you have any questions or you want to talk art or life or lighting or gear or whatever else, like contact me via email or through my website or through Instagram, like photography is wonderful, but people are my great passion. So if I have an opportunity to connect with any of you beyond this, um, whether it's in real life or through social media or just, you know, the email servers, um, let's do that because that brings me so much joy. So please don't be a stranger, even if it's just to say hi. And I'm so honored to be here. Thank you to the Guild and to Slav for inviting me. Uh, this is one of my greatest joys is to be able to just talk about these things that I love and share it with you. And it 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 gives a lot of meaning and fulfillment to me. So I just really appreciate the opportunity. I, I think it's been absolutely fantastic for, from both of you. Just to remind everyone, this is being recorded. You can log in again. And if you go to the chat, all the contact details for Johnny Slab and the Guild are on there in the chat. So you can revisit it. And the, the stuff that Johnny was just mentioning for direct contact is right at the top of the chat. So you're aware of it. So with that, I'm going to end it. I can't believe over an hour is gone. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny, you've been amazing. It's very easy yeah. to, to, to listen to him, isn't it? Thank you very much, Johnny, for accepting our invite. And thank you very much to to share your passion and your vision with this photography. We love you. We love the, 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 love is, the love is mutual. It's, it's, been, it's been a joy, truly. So everyone who's on here, I don't know when to say have a good evening, because in a lot of people's case, it's morning, isn't it? So wherever you are, have a good day. Yes. Take care, folks. Guys, I've Take been care. reading all your messages. Thank you very much for messaging, and thank you very much for attending. Yeah, th thank you for all the kind words, everyone, and for being here. And uh, go out and make some art that's important to you. Do that. And then come back to everything else. Because without that, there's nothing else. I love all of you and can't wait to see what you create. Bye.